Uh, <coughs> today's topic is about the calibration with surrogate. But before going into that topic, uh, I have a few more issues for the last lecture. And uh, here are the lists. The uh, first one is about the treating H in the Gaussian process regression. <coughs> the H is the, uh, <coughs> in my lecture note, the H represents the correlation parameter, parameter in the uh, appearing in the uh, correlation matrix. And uh, this is responsible for uh, how smoothly can we uh, uh, make uh, the curve a uh, path through uh, the data set points. And uh, previously, we have uh, considered this as a fixed value. But now I will show you there is a, also a way uh, to treat this uh, as the one of the unknowns in the estimation. The second thing is about the imposing uniqueness of the calibration. This issue was also uh, uh, explained previously. Uh, that uh, in case we introduce the discrepancy, we will end up with the, uh, some kind of a confounding problem between the uh, calibration parameter and the discrepancy parameter. Because of those two parameters, we will have non-unique solution. Every time we go through the Markov chain Monte Carlo, we will get a different answer. And that made me uncomfortable. So I will uh, show you how to avoid that problem by imposing uniqueness. Third one is the, the calibration by uh, increasing the number of parameters. Uh, the motivating example that I am doing now is always about one parameter. But uh, I can do that by increasing the parameters as well. And uh, I will show, uh, show you some of the results. And all these processes, this is, uh, in my case, this is my, uh, the important remark for me. All these processes can be easily taken care uh, as long as we understand the concept of the Markov chain Monte Carlo. And as long as, they, uh, as long as we know how to implement it. And all these issues, we can make it uh, very easily by adding some of the parameters or removing the parameters. So this kind of a, a very uh, trivial effort. In the other method, that would not be easy. For example, if, if we use the uh, inverse CDF or that's the same thing as the grid method, we will uh, have a, a much increased computation if we increase the parameters. But in the, the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, that's not so uh, a serious matter. We have a similar number of uh, calculation or iteration, we get the same answer. So that is another power of the, uh, this uh, process. The first one, the treating H in the Gaussian process regression. And uh, for this uh, issue, what I considered was this data set. Uh, in order to review or uh, practice one more time about what is the ordinary Gaussian process regression. In this case, we will try to make the curve pass through the data points. So, for that purpose, I introduced this example, this data set. One data at a point over this range. And at that time, what I showed you was uh, using the parameter h by increasing from this value to this value, I uh, obtained these uh, results. As we increase the value of h from here to here, you can see the trend of the uh, Gaussian process regression. Uh, we will have a smoother curve, and also we will have a 
less uncertainty, narrower bound of uncertainty. So that means that uh, we have a better results with the higher H values. But my experience, and also I gave you all the MATLAB codes uh, to you, you can uh, experience yourself. Uh, if we increase further, we will end up with the uh, singularity problem. So we get failure. And in my experience, for this particular problem, the uh, threshold value, I can say, uh, was somewhere around the 0.3. And with this uh, situation, we have uh, some kind of arbitrariness problem. Uh, what value is good for me in case we need to uh, uh, process this uh, using this data set? And the answer in the existing literature, not me, the common practice of the existing literature was to use the maximum likelihood estimation method. And this is uh, well established in the literature. And I show you one more time of those. You have to go through the optimization to get the uh, single uh, optimum value of H. And uh, according to that literature, they say this is the optimum, and use this. And that is their uh, recommendation. And once we have this value, we will also uh, can, uh, calculate the other uh, parameters. That all these are, uh, we call the, uh, these as the maximum likelihood estimation. In our problem, this is our problem. Apply this method and get this result. And the answer is 0.416. And I told you, using this, in my code, it gets failure. Singularity occurs. So I don't understand why most literature emphasizing this approach. So that's my problem. I'm not sure whether I made the code myself correctly or not, but uh, this is the case for me. I also plotted the function that was appearing in the previous page, and uh, we would like to optimize or minimize this function and get the solution, and that was this. The value of 0.416 was this. So this is just for reference for you. There is another way, instead of this deterministic approach, which is uh, the so-called full Bayesian approach. Uh, for this uh, Gaussian process regression, the unknown parameters during the process was uh, beta and sigma b. If you don't remember what it is, you can get back to the, the analytical expression here. Uh, in this uh, Gaussian process regression, we have the data. We'd like to estimate these two parameters based on the given H value. But we can add one more here. Previously, H was a given value. Now, we will treat it as the another unknown. So number of the unknown parameters will be three from two. And uh, let the Markov chain make the solution. And get this, uh, the familiar thing you see. Get this, the large number of samples. Previously, we obtained only two uh, primary samples. Now we have uh, three. Uh, primary samples, beta, sigma b, and also h. And we can also uh, calculate whatever kind of uh, uh, quantity from that distribution. In this case, I just uh, computed mean of those parameters. And uh, I repeated the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and got these answers. So the mean of uh, full Bayesian estimation the mean of H will be somewhere around this. So uh, a little different uh, 
uh, favor flavor from uh, this approach. And uh, I cannot say uh, the meaning of the difference and the reason of the difference here. But uh, the thing is, we have uh, this uh, results. If we employ the full Bayesian approach. And uh, personally, this seems to be better than this one because I experienced already if I increase more than uh, 0.3, it will get failure. Yes. Not mode. So mode, you can take a look at this uh, about the uh, three uh, point three five something. So, but I think if we mode, they should be close to the original. Right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because the original definition of the maximum likelihood is more toward the mode instead of mean. So, in that sense, you are correct, I guess. It's uh, just, uh, just a matter of convenience. I don't know. I still don't know how to uh, find out mode if it's the uh, large number of samples. Sometimes I get a strange uh, answer. That's because uh, I may not know how to, uh, uh, make, uh, how to calculate the mode in case of the samples. So it's a matter of uh, convenience. So your question is about the mean of this uh, H distribution. I mean, this mean value comes from NCNC. Yes. And what I'm saying is if we do another NCNC, that means will be changed. Yes. Every time we go through the MCMC, we get the different results. Right. So uh, I guess we already know because this is a kind of a stochastic process. So every time we go through a one uh, uh, process, we get the uh, and the another uh, process, we get the different answer. The second issue that I like to talk about is about the uniqueness of the calibration. Uh, when I explain this thing in the last lecture, Aniban. So I was wondering, uh, so, have you, so the mean process that you just showed us for a large number, uh -huh. um, has it ever failed whenever you have tested it? Oh, using this. Uh, yeah, that's a very critical question. And uh, it seems to me that the beta values vary a lot. I mean, even if you change H a little bit, the beta will vary a lot. Beta and the sigma D. So, uh, yeah, let me, uh, <clears throat> let me say one more time about your question. Your question is, uh, if I made uh, H as a, in the form of a samples, uh, individual value of those samples uh, may include the higher values as well. And in that case, using that value, we get failure. That is your question. And it may happen. So uh, that's another uh, difficulty that I have now. And uh, I told you uh, we are already at the front of the research area <laughs> in this topic. So that is another uh, uh, thing that we should solve uh, in the future. Yes. Okay, so you, you mentioned about 
and uh, I, I like to know which parts of the model have the singularity when you uh -huh. When I say uh, we get singularity, uh, at what parts we get it yeah. is your question in the MATLAB code. We have a command or function for multivariate normal distribution by inputting two things. One is the mean, the other is the covariance matrix. When this matrix, covariance matrix, it's responsible for the correlation between any two points. If this gets uh, closer to the singularity, we get failure. When we have uh, something like this, in that case, we don't get answer. Yeah, we get failure. So this means that we have a very strong correlation between the two points. And the next issue, the uniqueness issue. Because I was not comfortable, I looked through the literature uh, that have addressed this issue and uh, only found uh, two things. One from the, the famous Kennedy O'Hagan paper. At the end of the paper, there were discussions by the other uh, reviewers. Interestingly, there were uh, reviews uh, of the paper. Uh, it, that was included in the paper. And uh, one of the reviewers raised the question about this. And uh, his opinion was about uh, your approach may uh, get the uh, non-unique results. And uh, there was no answer. So this was only uh, listed in that paper. The other one was uh, made by uh, this author, another uh, famous paper, dealing with the spot welding. The comment was this. The author's opinion is we have a little choice. Even if we get the uh, confounding relation in the problem, we have to do with it. We have to live with it. And uh, that's the best we can do. That was the, uh, his opinion. And in my case, I just like to remove uh, the, uh, by uh, setting one of the parameters at uh, a fixed value, which is in this case, uh, let beta be zero, instead of uh, uh, treating it as unknown. That's my idea. Very simple. So, I hope you remember the thing. Every time when we include a discrepancy, uh, using the Gaussian process regression. And uh, we would like to estimate the calibration parameter and the Gaussian parameter simultaneously, also using, uh, including the observation error. Every time we go through the uh, process, we end up with a different result. That was the thing that I showed you before. Now, I just set the bias mean, beta, this can be any value. And uh, this can be varied in combination with this, because these two are confounded. These two are in correlation with each other. So I just fix one of these at a, a value, which is a zero here. Then the more promising thing is uh, if we increase the parameters, it is not good in terms of the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. But in this case, we decrease, we remove one parameter. So uh, the process is much better. So only we have uh, three parameters in the estimation, and the let it go, and the Markov chain Monte Carlo get me the results, and the result is this. And uh, every time we do this, we have uh, almost the same results. 
by setting the bias mean at zero. So this means that we uh, achieved a kind of a uniqueness in the solution. Third one is the calibration with the multiparameters. Previously, I just put here five, and I didn't consider this one, and only estimated this parameter, single parameter. Now, I attempt to uh, introduce this uh, function and uh, uh, estimate all three parameters using the Markov chain Monte Carlo. So the number of parameters is increased to three. And uh, already, already I uh, put the bias mean at zero. So I have only one GPR parameter for the discrepancy. And the last one, always the same, the observation error. So the total unknown parameters are these. Five parameters I have to estimate. Go through the MCMC, get this result. In this case, we already know the pattern of the true function. It was uh, 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 3.5 plus 1.7 minus uh, something. So because we already know the structure of the true behavior, uh, we can uh, make better estimation of that function, and this is the result. The true behavior is dotted black, and the green is the estimated uh, mean of the estimated one. So we get the perfect agreement. Also, as a result of this process, we also included discrepancy in this process. And the discrepancy is given like this, virtually zero. So we get uh, the best result we can get for this uh, motivating example. I said there are two purposes when we introduce discrepancy. One is to close the gap. If we made wrong assumption of, about the function, no matter how we try, we will uh, get the function like this. And we have a definite difference between the true and the function model. In that case, in order to compensate this difference, we introduce discrepancy and add this to, to make closer agreement to the data. That was one purpose. The other one is to examine the quality of the model. If we have a large discrepancy as a result of this, that means we made, we have a very uh, uh, bad computer model because we have uh, this much uh, discrepancy. If we have uh, almost zero discrepancy as a result of this, we are happy. We have a very good computer model that can closely simulate the reality. So the, the bias has that kind of a two purposes. Now, I start with the, uh, today's topic, which is to include a surrogate. This is very obvious. In case we do the estimation, we know that we need more than 1,000 number of uh, calculations in order to have the MCMC. And uh, if it's uh, like a turbulent flow simulation, it is never possible. So in case the computer model is expensive, natural choice is to use the surrogate instead of the original computer model. So this is replaced by some kind of a, a approximate model. And the rest is the same thing. The reality includes the model plus discrepancy. And the field data includes the reality plus the observation error. The rest is the same. And in this case, 
once we introduce the surrogate model for the GPR, we have a, a little confusion. We have uh, two kinds of GPR here. So we uh, should have the uh, uh, distinction between the two. And the unknowns to be estimated on this process is, uh, at first, the original calibration parameter. And secondly, the GPR parameters for the surrogate model of a computer model. And the third is the GPR parameters for discrepancy. And the last is the observation error. All these are the unknowns to be estimated. And as always the case, I go through the calibration process in the order of the complexity. And uh, for the purpose of uh, facilitating your understanding, I uh, repeat the previous cases. And after that, I will go through the surrogate. This makes you uh, better understand this, the most complex case of the calibration. And in all the, the cases, this is the central point. We are relying on the Bayesian framework, posterior of the unknowns, uh, proportional to the likelihood of the observation data based on the parameters, multiplied by their prior. This is the uh, fundamental thing. Uh, in this process. And I will show you only the likelihood. I don't want to uh, show you the, uh, even the posterior because the likelihood is virtually the posterior in case we have a non-informative prior. Non-informative prior, it, it means we just uh, multiply the constant. But in, this case, in the case of the standard deviation or the variance, that's a little different. In that case, we multiply this. Otherwise, we ignore. So likelihood is the same as the posterior. So keep in mind this in the uh, following derivation. The first is the, the simplest case that we dealt with in the uh, lecture notes, uh, 13th ne lecture notes. In this case, we have a computer model in its original form. And we have a data, uh, a pair of observation data, x, f, y, f. And we'd like to estimate a known parameter, calibration parameter theta, and the observation error, sigma. Very easy. And we have a n pair of observation data here. Then. In terms of the uh, implementation, this is uh, like uh, n by one vector. This is another n by one vector. After going through the Markov chain, we get a large number of samples for the two parameters, and uh, use those uh, samples to make another sample set for the posterior prediction. One is for the computer model. This is not a single value anymore. Theta has a thousand numbers. The same way the computer model has a thousand numbers. So uh, kind of a distribution. And uh, when I show you figure like this, the green is the mean of this computer model. The red is the upper and lower bound of this computer model. And this computer model, by adding uh, observation error to this, we will get the prediction of y, which includes the observation error. And the upper and lower bound of this prediction is given by magenta color. This is the thing we uh, learned at the beginning of the calibration. Next is the uh, including the discrepancy using the Gaussian process regression. In this case, the likelihood is 
this. One more parameter is added in the likelihood because of introduction of a Gaussian process for the discrepancy. And the function expression is given this way. So one more parameter is added. And uh, this sigma b represents the, uh, the uncertainty of the, how do I say, the Gaussian process regression in between the points. If this value goes higher, we have a large uh, upper and lower bound of the Gaussian process. If this is smaller, we have a slim uh, bounds between the points. And uh, do the same thing. Into the Markov chain Monte Carlo, we get the samples of the three parameters. Once we have those uh, three parameters, a sample set, we apply those values into this equation. But in this equation, the thing is much more complicated because of GPR. Every time I explain GPR, it's not easy uh, to uh, get you what its idea. In this case, we have to use this equation to calculate the discrepancy using the obtained samples. The red part are the estimated samples as a result of the Markov chain Monte Carlo. So you can think of this as the individual number and individual number of this, individual of this, and get the value and repeat the same thing uh, with the same amount of the sample, uh, same number of the samples. Uh, so the result is the uh, distributed form of this. We have this solution, this solution. This is a computer model. This is the discrepancy in the form of a GPR. Add these two, get the reality. And add observation error to this to get the prediction. And the result is here. So the blue line represents the mean of this uh, reality. And the red two curves represent the upper and lower bound of this reality. This reality, yr, has already accounted for the discrepancy. So this is not the math model, uh, computer model. This is inclusion of the discrepancy. And the final one is the uh, upper and lower bound of the prediction. So in that way, you have to interpret the curves of that figure. Yes. Q, QB, QB is the correlation matrix between any two points. Okay. Yes. And in this case, I don't treat the H as unknown. In this particular case, I just put H at a point two, so a fixed value. You can do this same thing by turning this into the unknown and adding uh, in the unknowns list and uh, do the same thing. Now, uh, we begin to go through the calibration with the surrogate. And uh, I think we already learned about the surrogate model. In this case, the example we uh, are considering, we have uh, two parameters. One is the, uh, how do I know, just input a variable. We know it. The other is the uh, parameters, unknown parameters. We'd like to calibrate this based on the data. So one is the known variable. The other is the unknown variable. But in order to make the surrogate, these two should be used in that purpose, uh, we need to uh, generate sample points using the design of experimental technique 
for these two uh, parameters or variables. So for this purpose, I introduce another uh, letter or variable uh, capital X that includes these two parameters. And uh, in, for example, if we use the Latin hypercube and the 21 sample points, we get the uh, answer like this. And uh, let the computer model uh, get the output at each of these uh, points. Then we will obtain this pair of uh, data sets. And I will call the number of uh, computer uh, experimental points is M as opposed to N. N is the field, number of field data. Field observation number of is N. And on the other hand, M is the number of uh, computer experiments. So once we have the, uh, those data, the computer experimental points and the output of the computer model, then we will uh, uh, go to the Gaussian process regression based on this expression. The same thing that we uh, considered in the uh, discrepancy, but only the difference is the data. In that case, the data was from the field observation in this case, the data, we make it by using the design of an experimental technique. So we have a two sets of data, one from the field, the other from the computer model output. And uh, every time we introduce the Gaussian process regression, there, is, there exists also the associated uncertainty because of because it's surrogate. So we should include this uncertainty in the estimation as well. But before going into that direction, a kind of a remedial or a simpler version of the approach is the, the so-called uh, plug-in approach. In this case, we don't, we don't treat this uh, Gaussian process in a stochastic way. We treat this as a deterministic way. We just think this as a deterministic approximation. We have a well-established formula or equation if it's a deterministic uh, version. I already showed you uh, some of the formulas in uh, which is here, MLE estimation. That is the thing. We just use that formula. In that case, we can point estimate the beta, point estimate the sigma b. That is it. We don't go further. Originally, if we have to be a fully Bayesian, in that case, we have to obtain these parameters in the form of a samples or distribution. But in this case, forget it. We just use this deterministic value. And assume that is a deterministic model and uh, put those, the original model out and plug this into that. That's it. That is the uh, simpler approach. That's why the people call this as a plug-in approach. And uh, there is a justifying reason for this, because the uncertainty in the surrogate model, most likely much less than the other uncertainties, like a discrepancy and observation error. So uh, we don't have to make efforts by including this kind of small uncertainty into the whole thing. So, we just forget this. In that case, I repeat writing that expression that I showed you before here. 
the same thing. But uh, we have uh, some uh, notational difference here. So we have to pay uh, careful attention. Uh, if you are seriously using this in your Im implementation, you need to uh, know exactly the meaning of each expression. And the rest is the same thing. We have a deterministic uh, surrogates of the original model and put this into the uh, process, which is, in that case, the uh, calibration, including the discrepancy. And we estimate the unknown parameters at the bottom of the slide, the red symbols, theta, calibration parameter, sigma b, discrepancy parameter, and uh, sigma, observation error. So the LHS from the several gate includes the theta? The LHS as a sorrow gate was used only for making estimation of these things. The variables of the surrogate is again the same uh, as the uh, variables uh, so, so yeah, used in the Latin hypercube. So, theta, so for example, in the example that we had, the surrogate will have the three thetas and the x will be four variables or two variables if there is one x and one theta. Yeah, I just show you for your better understanding uh, some kind of example case 21 data. Uh, horizontal is x variable, the familiar x. You remember from 0 to 3, we have an equal interval and uh, the thing. This is x. And uh, within this computer model, we had theta. And we make design of experiments using these two, uh, how do I say, variable or parameters. Horizontal is x, vertical is theta. We know already the x is ranged between 0 and 3, so we divide uh, into a, a finite interval. And we also, uh, it's a kind of a tricky thing, but uh, we also know the range of theta, although it's unknown, it will be somewhere between 0 to uh, 1. So we can uh, make a finite interval of this, and uh, the familiar Latin hypercube is made. Then we have uh, samples of uh, x and theta with uh, a certain number. It goes through the computer model and get the y output y. And uh, from that time on, we forget the original model. We uh, establish the uh, Gaussian process regression. That is the thing. Yes. Right. The direct function you remember, it was uh, this one. We forget this. We will use totally based on this data, we will use the approximated function. Because of time limitation, I did not make implementation results for this case. And uh, that's, for that, I apologize. Every time when I uh, make an issue and uh, teach, 
I also uh, made a codes that implement, implements a thing. But uh, in this case, I didn't do that. So uh, it's only in the, the theory. So the rest is the same thing, as I told you. We estimate these three unknown parameters and uh, go to the I'm sorry, go to uh, goes to the posterior prediction, and uh, I did not explain about that here because it's uh, only a repetition. And the final one, yes. Data in your DOE, but data is just a single value, right? Data is just a single value, right? Because it's a computer model output. But if data is a single value, uh, then you can why are you putting that in the DOE? Uh, the question is, I don't understand. You mean the, uh, the, the parameter theta yeah. is a part of the computer model? So it's just one value. It's just a one particular value. So then in the DOE, you generate the values of theta. We just replace this to some other easy to compute function. That's the idea whatever it is. In this particular case, I just show you the GPR. But if you are not happy with this, you use the other one. Use the a polynomial. In that case, you will have to uh, make uh, two parameters polynomials. Like, uh, how do I say? Alpha 1 x, alpha 2 theta, alpha 3 x theta, alpha 4 x square, alpha 5, theta square, something like this. And uh, get the solution for these coefficients. And uh, use this function afterwards instead of this. But theta is a constant in the function, right? The original function, phi is exponential minus theta. Right? Yeah, here it's a constant. But now it's a function of a, a this is a variable here. It's an unknown constant that you want to, to estimate. So that's why you need a range of values. But the true function, when, whenever you use a DOE, you also evaluate the true function value. So if you evaluate the true function value, how are you putting in, where are you putting in the different values of data? In that? But then the, that's not the true function value anymore, right? You don't know what theta is. Uh, that's the purpose of calibration. Right. Once you make this surrogate function, you use this to calibrate theta instead of the original function. Taiki. In this case, in terms of x, it's one dimensional. Okay. And uh, in that case, theta is just a parameter, okay. coefficient. But you, if we uh, turn our view point differently, turning here, that in that case, the uh, function is a two variables function. Only for the purpose of calculation. Only for the purpose of calculation. Right. right. So Wednesday I will continue and uh, some of the applications about this.